This is the BioCentury Show. Brought to you by the 24th BioEquity Europe, scheduled for May 2024 in San Sebastian, Spain. Join BioCentury EBD Group and Regional Host Committee Chair ECO's Capital for Biotech's premier CEO and investor conference in one of the culinary capitals of the world. Hello and welcome to the BioCentury Show. I am Simone Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief at BioCentury, and I'm so happy to be joined today by Karen Wagner, Managing Partner at ECOS Capital. ECOS was founded in 2008, has offices in Barcelona and, importantly, in San Sebastian in Spain, where we are holding this year's BioEquity Europe Conference. We're going to get into some discussion about the Spain ecosystem shortly, but I want to give you a very brief background on Karen, who joined ECOS in 2008 with more than 10 years experience in BD, um, having worked in biotech and pharma companies. Karen is now on the board of five companies, all in Europe, and two of which are in Spain. So Karen, that is a great place for us to start. San Sebastian has many wonderful things about it. I think it's more commonly known as a gastronomic center. We could talk about that, but I think we probably shouldn't. So why don't we talk instead about the Spain ecosystem, which, which is what brings us there, of course. What can you tell us? Not many people in the U.S. know that much about it, maybe outside the U.S. either. Talk a little bit about the Spain ecosystem and why San Sebastian. Okay. First of all, thanks a lot for having me. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And of course, we're very excited about bioequity and the opportunity to host it and to welcome all these international visitors who hopefully will not only enjoy um, the great food, but also hopefully good weather. It rains a lot in San Sebastian. So those of you that think you may be you, you may be escaping the windy, rainy London or US, you may not be so so certain. Yeah, anyway, but I want to say so, that they can still come inside and have great discussions and partnering meetings, right? And finance. Absolutely, they should <laughs> even spend more time, yes. <laughs> um, so biotech in Spain, as you already mentioned, we got started in 2008. We were the first venture capital fund in biotech in Spain at the time. Um, now, of course, this is a long time ago. We've seen the ecosystem for 15 years uh, and and, and we, we're proud that many of the companies that are now emerging as clinical stage companies are companies we financed in the beginning. So we certainly played a big role in that ecosystem coming together. If we're talking about biotech in Spain, we're talking about 200 companies that you would define, you know, biotech companies in therapeutic human health. Um, there's about 20 set up every year, um, just there's about 100 that receive venture capital funding according to global data. So we're talking a relatively limited ecosystem, but still an ecosystem that has is relatively robust. And of course, there's a lot of services and tools company and a lot of companies in clean tech, agro tech and other industries. Our database, and again, we've been here for 15 years, um, has about 500 companies. So that gives you the total universe of, of human health companies. There's also larger companies, um, Almiral, Grifols, Esteve, Ferrer, and a couple of others. And then the large multinationals um, also operate in Spain, not only commercially, but they also have R&D centers. Um, AstraZeneca has recently opened a big hub in Barcelona, which is very exciting, over 800 million investment, over 1,100 people. And this is going to um, be you know, working on new R&D fusing science and data. So I'm assuming it's taking advantage of, um, of the very big um, hub we have in particular in, in Barcelona, but also elsewhere in Spain on, on digital and, and, and communication. Um, what can I tell you? So in terms of distribution across the country, um, Catalonia is the largest biotech hub. Um, next um, is Madrid. And the bus country is around, well, then is Andalusia, Valencia, and the bus country is the fifth largest hub. Um, in general, in Spain, in addition to these emerging biotech companies, we have two strongholds. We have a really strong manufacturing industry in, in, in biotech. It's very well known, um, very robust, relatively um, reasonable cost. 
And this is one of the strengths of the bus country. So that's why I mentioned it. And another big advantage we have is we have large hospitals um, running a lot of clinical trials for the industry. So it's one of the, I think it's the fifth largest country for running clinical trials. Um, again, very well organized hospitals, um, lots of patients that are participating, um, reasonable cost and very well organized. So these are some of the advantages. Um, let, me, um, the, let me jump in then and talk about sure. investing in advantages. So all the companies that you're on the board are Europe-based. I'm not sure if that is part of ECOC's mandate, but something we think about every year at Bioequity, maybe you can talk about it, is whether you think that focusing in Europe gives you any advantage given that most US VCs focus most of their activity on the big US hubs and certainly on the US, and they don't pay that much attention to Europe. So on the one hand, is there an advantage? And then on the other hand, is it easy or hard for you to find US firms to syndicate with? And how important is that? Maybe talk a little bit about the biotech investing landscape. Okay, so first of all, ECOS, we do invest in the US. About one third of our investments are in the US. And the last two investments, Neurona and Endrail, were US investments. And um, we were also in Mineralis, which, which um, is one of the public ones. So um, why do we mostly invest in Europe? Um, well, we are based in Europe. We believe there's a lot of very good science. Um, there is The innovation is there. Um, there is a translational gap. Um, but there is also a little bit less competition and more reasonable expectations. So we believe there's a lot of hidden gems in Europe, and we absolutely believe the operational experience and strengths is there. Um, and the financing strengths is also good. There's more late stage funds now. The only really the only big thing we're missing is a is a public uh, public market that's functioning across Europe. So apart from the fact that all of our large successful companies in the end list on NASDAQ, um, because that's where you know the public investors are, and that's in the end where most of the M&As happen from Big Pharma, um, everything is there in Europe. And again, it, it happens as a more, um, at a more um, capital efficient way. Um, and, and there's a lot of proprietary um, access to science. And what about um, syndicating with US VCs? Yes, Is that thanks for the reminder. Um, so um, Europe faces some challenges with the regulations and the, uh, the languages in the different countries. So we usually see that um, international investors, in particular US investors, start syndicating when they know a particular venture fund. So as an example, when we got started, all of our companies in Spain got syndicated with local investors. Now they are all internationally syndicated and these include NEA and other large US investors, but because they know us. Um, so usually it's after um, having a lead investor that knows the, the laws and the way to deal with the administrative pieces of an investment, which can be really scary. Um, is when investments happen. The other point is, of course, I mentioned the capital efficiency. So that also means that very large US funds that are used to deploying 50 million tickets or more, there aren't that many of these mega rounds in Europe. So yeah. it depends on how much capital you want to deploy. Um, there's sometimes not the teams and not the, you know, not the plans to, de to, uh, to, to put that money to use. Well, let's turn now, um, you know, to one question that is the theme of this year's Bioequity Europe, which is rising above the noise. And I want to explain that the idea is that even after the downturn and what a lot of people see as a sort of culling of biotechs, there's still many, many companies out there looking for financing and deals. And part of that, if you ask me, is just because of the march of biology. There are many translational scientists looking to turn discoveries into therapies. So they are, you know, however good you are, there's there's a lot of noise out there as well. Now, at the same time, we here, investors and farmers are like inundated with requests, and they also have to figure out how to narrow down the list. So as you think about funding new companies in this environment, or even existing companies adding to them, you know, you know, there's a two part question. What makes a company rise above the noise for you? And the second part is whether in this sort of capital constrained environment, your criteria have changed. So the, 
So we invest um, therapeutic area and modality agnostic. Um, we invest in single assets as well as in platforms with proprietary pipelines. So that opens a very large field. We also invest from anything seed to series C, right? So that, that becomes a very large universe. Um, the way we think about it is we like to define areas that we are interested in. To give you an example, we started investing in ADCs three years ago, and we've been following that theme after first investment in Accendo, then with Tagworks more recently. Um, so we like to follow themes. Another theme was regenerative cell therapy, which we believe has come of age. Um, and then we try and go about it not totally strategically. There's also some opportunistic deals that happen if they are local, but we try and start from the themes. Then for any single company, um, it's about the strengths of the science and, and then about the strengths of the team. So how do you raise, rise about, above the noise? By having the most spectacular data. Mm -hmm. um, and having that data in a setting, I mean, in a well-defined experimental setting, you know, well-defined preclinical studies or cl clinical studies, um, good pub comparators, um, and focus on the data. And then, of course, very good development plans. It sounds obvious, but we still get, you know, people talking to us about a development plan in oncology that takes five million, right, to do a phase two in oncology. So comprehensive, very thorough plans that lead to really good um, binary outcomes, if you want, really... So if you're, if you're talking to a preclinical company, you want to see really solid preclinical data, but you expect them also to have mapped out their clinical path realistically? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I mean, we can help them with that, but we, we really want people to understand there's a lot of competition out there uh, and they need to think about the differentiation early on. Um, yeah. Stating the obvious here again. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I do actually want to ask another question along these lines. So quite, you know, sometimes companies quite early on will get a deal with a pharma company. Does that for you represent a validation of the technology and make you more likely to invest? Or do you sort of think that you, you prefer to be the first sort of big voice in there? Um, we do think it's a validation, in particular if it's technology platforms and it's not the lead asset. So several of our companies announced deals, for example, Splice with Spark last year or uh, Vivid as well. I think this is uh, a great validation for a technology platform. It brings in expertise um, and uh, and it brings cash and uh, non-dilutive cash. You mentioned previously, you know, capital constricted periods. Um, non-dilutive capital is also something that's quite attractive because it, it helps build um, lab space, resources, hire people. And there's always a cross fertilization in my mind from, from these uh, programs to, to the lead asset. Okay, so yes, well, we're totally in favor. Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, we're going to talk, a, we'll take a brief break now. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of what I would call, let's say, structural aspects of building biotechs, including diversity and ESG. For more than 20 years, BioEquity Europe has been where CEOs and investors gather to network, partner, and debate critical issues facing the biotech industry. In 2024, BioEquity heads to San Sebastian, Spain in Basque Country, May 12th to 14th. Join BioCentury, EBD Group, and Regional Host Committee Chair ECOS Capital in one of the world's culinary capitals for a destination event designed for CEOs, investors, and decision makers across the global biopharma ecosystem. In 2023, 300 VCs and 330 biotech CEOs joined BioEquity in Dublin, Ireland. In San Sebastian, the program will feature more than 100 emerging biotechs that will present their story to investors and potential partners. Don't wait, last year's BioEquity conference sold out. Visit bioequityeurope.com for more information. We are back at the BioCentury show with Karen Wagner from Isios Capital. Karen, before the break, we talked about some of the uh, criteria that you use in terms of looking for companies to invest in, rising above the noise. Now, I want to talk about what I, as I said, have referred to as structural things. It's no secret that I'm a big proponent of diversity measures. I personally have also written recently 
about what I consider a hit to the DEI movement in the US in particular. Um, e either way, I think it's clear that the ground is shifting uh, so, to some degree in enthusiasm, but I, I think there's no lack of need for more diversity and leadership. Um, I want to ask you, because I know you've been very active in this area, when you, how are you looking at this landscape as a member of biotech and as a, as a VC? And, and let's talk first about sort of executive teams in biotech companies. Um, so, so this comes, so for us, this comes from ESG, um, you know, very basics. Um, you want companies that are um, socially and governmentally um, well managed. And you also, of course, um, want them to have not too big of an, Im uh, of, of an impact on the economy, uh, on, on, on the environment. Um, so I think the fundamentals of that are very clear. More diverse teams generate best, better businesses, as you've written. They are they generate more return. They are more resilient. They are more uh, adaptable in times of change. Um, it, it makes every sense in the world. In Europe, ESG is a lot more prominent than in the US and it continues to be implemented. So I think from the side of limited partners, from the side of governments, this stream continues. Um, and, uh, and diversity for me is embedded within the G part. So how do we think about it? Okay, we as a general manager group of GP group of ESIOS, we are majority women run. Um, of course, we see the world a bit differently. Um, for us, this comes naturally. We, if we look at our statistics, we have more diverse companies than the universe that's out there. But I can't really tell tell you if it's because we don't have a bias or less of a gender bias. Um, we have less of a discussion in Europe about et, et, ethnical diversity, just because there is less et, et, ethnical diversity here in Europe. Um, so it's mainly a discussion about gender diversity. European laws are also a lot more restrictive about um, disclosing, you know, sexual preferences or things. So we have to tread very carefully, um, even with um, with trying to go further beyond gender diversity. That's obvious. Um, how do we think about it in our company? So first of all, um, for all these topics, um, we're trying to use our network to bring more senior people in. We also implement some HR policies in our portfolio companies. And of course, we have HR policies within ECOS to have um, unbiased uh, selection processes for candidates, um, blinded case studies, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, there's really um, no magic beyond that. Um, we have we are monitoring ESG. Um, we are also providing um, our companies tools for ESG. Um, but we're not enforcing, we're trying to enforce um, on a senior management level, but we can't really enforce um, hiring of any people. Um, they are too small companies to have um, to have candidates that don't deliver. As you've written, I, I think this is a critical point. Every single individual that we hire into our companies on a senior level um, needs to deliver. So I want to come back to ESG broadly in a minute, but I'm going to stay with this because, you know, as you know, I'm doing an analysis or have done an analysis on companies in Europe that rose above the noise. And I have to tell you, there's really, really very few um, of the companies that were, you know, got the most funding or got deals with farmers. That's our, our cohort of companies. There's very few with women CEOs and there's a lot of founder CEOs and it really seems that there, there's just a lot more um, founder CEOs who are male than female. So this isn't really a pipeline issue of, oh, people have been there for that long. So even outside of Isios, do you think that there are, you know, still a lot of um, sort of inherent biases that you might be more willing to take? Uh, sorry, when I said founder CEOs, many of them are first time CEOs as well. They're founder CEOs first time CEOs. And so do you think that there's still um, really just a lot of cultural or other factors behind the idea that, um, you know, people are more willing to take a, a chance on a first time CEO who's male than female? 
Yeah, I think there are several. I mean, we don't have any proprietary research into this. I and I can't speak for ECOs. My personal opinion is it's a combination of two things. Yes, there are very strong cultural um, cultural reasons why women don't raise to CEO in the first place, and there are certainly reasons why investors would prefer. Uh, a CEO they've known before, a serial entrepreneur who is much more likely, you know, to be a man um, than a first-time female CEO. Um, so we see quite often a push from investors once an investment has happened to change the CEO, and then of course to go to work with somebody that you know that, that, that the VCs on the board have known before, which again is usually a male. So there is a couple of really important topics here that we need to tackle. Um, and it's a very slow going process, right? Because you don't get serial women entrepreneurs unless you financed the ones before. Um, but I, 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 I mean, if, if I look at our statistics in, in, in Spain, um, about 22% of the companies are supposed to have um, female CEOs. And, and if you look at um, the percentage that has mixed gender teams, it's over half. So, you know, you wrote about this too. We shouldn't only look at uh, women CEOs, but we should at the mixed teams and and, and where women uh, are able to have, um, to gain leadership experience from, from a C-suite, which, which then next time around, I think they are more likely to take a CEO job. So um, one more question on this uh, line is about the VC universe. You know, we've uh, also focused on that at Bioequity in, in partnership with uh, young VCs and, and, and other groups. Um, and, you know, do you find that there's any pressure from LPs? Are LPs interested in having VCs have women investors, um, you know, in, in their teams? I I I, I don't... Personally, think that at least the LPs we have in our funds take um, that detailed view. Um, I think they ask for reporting. They find it nice. Um, for example, we we got this diversity VC label, and we are the first biotech fund and the first European fund that that got it. Has that really moved the needle? You know, have uh, we've received a couple of comments, very nice, but. Is this going to impact how they take a choice of investing next time? I really don't think it is. As long as you comply with the standards of ESG um, reporting, I, I, I don't think this is the one moving um, piece. We do see more LPs being women, so I do think it helps you know, avoiding bias or, or reducing bias um, to have a more gender equal system, but, but I, yeah. So I have one more question and then we'll go to some science questions, but I do want to raise this. There are a lot of people, um, I'm, I can't give you numbers, but there are some loud voices, in particular in the US, who think it is wrong and a nonsense to even think about ESG and for companies to have social charters. They think that, you know, companies need only to focus on the finances and they shouldn't be worrying about the environment or governance or gender and, you know, the market should work that out. What do you think? And how do you respond to them? Yes, uh, I, I mean, again, Europe is different. We have absolute certainty that um, ESG is important. The fundamentals here are impact. We want to have impact as an industry. Now, of course, our, our impact is on, if you think of sustainable development goals, um, healthcare, um, well-being of people. Um, but we do need to do that in a way that is um, social and governmentally well organized and, 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 and with a measured and careful approach to resources used. Um, in Europe, there is a lot of push. There is a lot of reporting. What we've seen is that since we've developed questionnaires for our portfolio companies where they have to report, for example, on carbon footprint, it creates a different set of conversation. As always, when you start generating data, um, you um, generate um, a fact-based discussion about what you can do to implement changes. And I do think it makes all the difference. So I can only recommend to the US to uh, yeah, go it, back to the 
Is it a distraction? Are you spending time on no, that? No, it's not. It's it's not a distraction. It's a, I mean, once you implement the tools, um, there's so many easy tools these days to collect this information. Um, it's not a distraction at all. Um, and it's definitely um, helping the business understand where its fundamentals are. And it also doesn't enforce, we're not going to enforce any carbon footprint reduction goals for our companies, which makes no sense. So you need to be pragmatic about these. Um, but um, we sit on several of these um, Invest Europe councils to try and define those standards. And uh, one of the early issues was how to collect the data and then how to standardize the reporting. Now that we are beyond this, I think we can focus on the data collection. So you don't find the business community pushing back on these initiatives? No, we don't. In fact, every one of our companies, once they started reporting, were very enthusiastic about, um, about the contributions of their employees to ideas for carbon footprint um, reduction um, and, uh, you know, new ideas um, left and right. And it's um, our, our, I mean, employees of our portfolio companies, in particular, the young ones, are really very um, concerned about climate change um, and they want to do whatever they can. So so in in some ways, it's almost like a recruiting benefit, in fact, is what I, I sort of hear from some people. Yes. So, you know, just while we're there, tell us a little bit, let's stay in Barcelona or, or, or the you know, a bus region a little bit, you know, are there different regional considerations for either gender equity or for other aspects of ESG that, that you think about within um, Europe? It's like, is Spain, you know, more inclined in one direction? So, um, I mean, in Spain, our stronghold and the largest investment goes, goes towards digital and communication. Uh, one of the big elements is mobile and big data. Um, so, um, of course, um, there is, that's a more, uh, a, a much larger universe. Um, and, uh, and things are very different from classical industrial backgrounds as, as we have in the past country. Um, we also have a lot of, because of, because of the digital and, and, and the healthcare, uh, the health tech background, um, a lot of companies, that um, are in in AI um, and by nature um, they are going to be more diverse um, because they are going to recruit a lot of a lot of software engineers from other right. parts of the world. Um, those seem to feel very welcome um, and they are very mobile. So I I think that will change the way our industry works. Um, initially in drug discovery, but in particular in health, health tech. Actually, I, I wanted to thank you for going there because I really did want to ask you, given the emphasis on digital, in how and where you see AI having its you know, near-term impact in drug development. We hear so much about um, AI related to drug discovery and designing molecules and so on. And I think there's still a lot of back and forth on that. But obviously, it's being applied across the continuum and also being applied inside company operations. What are you seeing in terms of impact of AI and where, where, where do you expect us to start really gathering benefits? So we don't invest in AI in ourselves. So um, I can, you know, I can, I can tell you what what I've heard or where we believe. I, I mean, initially we saw this coming years ago in the medtech and diagnostics because you just couldn't um, have a device without um, some some data application. Um, AI now, I think um, the key topics are going to be in identifying, discovering targets, um, then in drug discovery and a little bit in selection of patients for clinical trials. Um, I think the real de novo, you know, cell and uh, totally novel um, um, small molecules, the initial results have been disappointing as we all hear. I think this is going to come a little bit later. And the key challenges are in clinical trials, uh, regulatory environment is not going to make it very easy to circumvent tox studies. It would be great if we could avoid toxicology studies and, and, and go straight into men. Um, but I don't I did I don't see those coming anytime soon. But do you see uh, and this is my last question, do you see sort of you know operational um you know benefits from AI? 
maybe, you know, either helping you select patients better. I mean, you've talked about the large health mm -hmm. data kind of infrastructure that you have there. Yes. Uh, yes, of course. I think these are going to be very relevant um, in, 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 in finding the right patients in particular. And, and as I said, also in drug discovery. Um, but um, yeah, again, the, what's expensive in our industry is the long clinical trials and, and, and the large toxicology studies and the lengthy manufacturing. And I don't see how those can be fundamentally replaced anytime soon. Not going to bend the curve there. Thank you very much. This has been a great conversation, and I look forward to a great meeting in um, San Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Brought to you by the 24th Bioequity Europe, scheduled for May 2024 in San Sebastian, Spain. Join BioCentury EBD Group and Regional Host Committee Chair ECO's Capital for Biotech's premier CEO and investor conference in one of the culinary capitals of the world.